Okay. All right. So welcome back, uh, everyone. We will continue with the last two verses of uh, 1 John chapter 1. But before that, uh, Manu has a question here in the chat section. She says, uh, what will happen if Christian doesn't repent uh, of their sin? Please God, will God punish them? Okay. And in continuation, uh, I think she says, if believers do what they want and uh, not going according to God, then uh, God uh, does something for that believer. Is God going to punish? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Manu, you've uh, asked the same question twice. Uh, the answer to that is, yes, if a believer does not repent, uh, we've seen that in the verses that we have uh, uh, read sometime back as well, where the believer, he is walking in a light, right? So verse 6, 1 John chapter 1, it says, uh, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, which is walk, meaning living a life, darkness, which means there is sin in the life, like uh, consistently, then what happens? We lie. Okay. So uh, that shows us that we are not in step with God. We are not obedient to God. Okay. <coughs> but God is faithful uh, in drawing us back to himself. Whenever we read the word of God, obviously we know the word of God is like a double-edged sword. It works within our uh, hearts, right? Uh, so the word of God works. Then we have the Holy Spirit. We are told in, uh, in uh, uh, God's word that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Holy Spirit is also speaking to our hearts. Now when God is faithful uh, to bring us to a point of realization, the next thing that needs to be done is our response. Where we say, okay, God, you are talking to me about this sin in my life. I repent. I will let go uh, of, of this habit. Or you set me free, deliver me from, from this uh, habit or this sin. And God, I will walk righteously before you. So that is what a believer needs to do when the Holy Spirit is ministering and the word of God is ministering to that person. But if they don't, this thing about we lie and we live a life, that is a life of self-deception, right? So then what happens? Are there consequences? Will God punish that person? You know, the way we must look at this is God will continue to minister to us because he is long-suffering uh, according to the word of God. But there are consequences to our wrongdoing, okay? which that is not God's, uh, you know, God imposing a, a certain punishment on us. But, you know, when, when we uh, just, for example, if you, if we are proud, okay, the Bible says pride goes before a fall. So pride goes before destruction. There is a consequence to my arrogance. Okay, So I face that consequence, not because God is punishing me, but that action has a consequence, right? So we will experience the consequence of our sin. And in the long run, you know, we are told that uh, it is possible for people who uh, are unrepentant to completely fall away from God. Uh, if you study the epistles that Peter wrote, you know, he talks about those who fall away from God. Uh, what happens? What exactly happens? You know, people people go so far away from God that uh, you know at some point their conscience is uh, very hard and uh, they are not able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit anymore. Right? So they are completely cut away from God. Completely cut away from receiving the blessings of God and thereby their, their life may seem like, you know, there, there is, uh, they're ex experiencing uh, punishment from God or, or, or things like that. But 
that's how it is manu uh, we bring a lot of things upon ourselves it's not that god is punishing us but yes at some point if we become so rigid uh, and fall away from god and also hebrews chapter 6 talks about uh, such an experience that for people who have uh, fallen away got too far uh, from god it's even difficult to come back right uh, and we go away from the umbrella of god's protection so things can happen in our lives where you know satan uh, destroys satan attacks satan uh, brings in so many things into our, our lives uh, and uh, it may seem like the punishment of god i'm reminded of saul uh, in the old testament you remember when he became disobedient uh, the blessings which he experienced initially it wasn't there because that entire cover of god's protection slowly it just started leaving him and uh, his life towards the end was uh, uh, quite sad to see so that's the answer manu that it, it's not that god is uh, going to punish us for our sin but you know there are the regular consequences that follow uh, and yes at, at some point when we are so rigid uh, even god takes notice and uh, we can we can add to what we have said so far we can also say that for disobedience uh, you know god can also uh, kind of bring in that judgment over our lives but invariably we ask for it god is so faithful and so long suffering that he never wants that to happen so the quicker we uh, respond to god and say god i'm sorry the better so uh, the lord's prayer once again i'm reminded of that where we are told every day right like we we pray that every day we pray it very often we say forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us so be conscious on a regular basis that yes there can be things in my life where you know th- those things are not right i am not perfect okay god uh i repent of these things that you're convicting me about and uh, please bring me out of it so that should be our daily walk and that's what uh, apostle john is actually writing he said that you live in that sense of uh, awareness of any form of sin uh, and if you notice any sin you know you repent of it and uh, god has already made provision for our cleansing through the blood of jesus and that blood will cleanse you it will clean you up okay so why not does it make sense yes thank you so much sir okay great yeah thank you so yeah that's a very good question which uh, manu asked now moving forward we were at verse 8 of 1 john chapter 1 uh, and it says if we say that we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us in continuation to what we just mentioned we lie okay and we deceive ourselves what is deceive ourselves you know it's a state of mind where we think we are right but we are not actually right and nobody is able to convince us that we are wrong including ourselves so uh, you know in uh, terms of psychology and all they they say that you live in another reality uh you're not able to accept the reality or the truth of what's going on you live in a separate reality okay uh but everyone knows maybe you yourself too know it deep within that uh, that is not the truth but you're unable to accept it so deceive ourselves you know the uh, most important thing that we must preserve is our conscience because the holy spirit ministers to us and conscience is uh, 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 that that uh, voice that he that speaks or and echoes what the holy spirit is talking to us and when our, when the when the holy spirit keeps us in check when our conscience keeps us in check we can live a righteous life because i can hear these voices inside me show me what is right okay 
But imagine, I have completely shut down to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking and speaking and saying, oh, don't do this. It's not good for you. It's destroying you. It's destroying your family. I'm not listening. Right? Worst case scenario, my conscience is alerting me. And it's saying, don't walk in that path. You're going to fall off the cliff very soon. Stop, stop, stop. But I have come to a place where I'm not listening to my conscience also. Okay? Self-deceived. That is extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. And, uh, uh, you know, every believer must be careful to keep their conscience alive, uh, keep their conscience as an echo of the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that responsibility lies with us. Now, I'm reminded of uh, Paul writing to Timothy when he talks about uh, uh, ministry. He says, ministry with good conscience. It's a very beautiful thing. So we have to preserve our conscience and the voice of our conscience. Okay. Uh, and that will not only help us be good believers to fellowship, to have true fellowship with the Godhead, but also it will help us have true fellowship with one another and keep us moving forward in our walk with the Lord. But if our conscience is not good, we are deceptive. You know, no amount of listening to the truth will make a difference because we have convinced ourselves that what I am saying is correct. In other words, we are, we are saying that God is a liar because the Holy Spirit is saying something. But our truth is opposite to the voice of God. So what are we actually saying? We are saying, God, your word is a lie. And I will do whatever I want to do. That is the most dangerous place for any believer. It's self-deception. We deceive ourselves. See, that's what verse 8 says. If we say that we have no sin, any believer... Yes, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, sin shall not have any dominion over us. But does this positional reality in Christ Jesus mean that you and I do not commit any sin in our uh, daily walk with the Lord? I'm sure all of us agree that we do fall sometimes. We do make mistakes. right? We do intentionally or unintentionally commit sin. But when we maintain this attitude of seeking repentance for that sin, you know, we should not say that I am perfect. The moment we say I am perfect, that's a path to destruction. So we don't say that there is no sin in me. No, there are a lot of things, there are weaknesses uh, that, that I see uh, and God, I pray that you would Forgive those sins, Lord. I want to change. You know, that attitude of I want to change, that is a precious gift which a believer must maintain throughout his lifetime. Okay? So never say that I have no sin in me. If we say that, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there is an action required on our part and that is confession. So does it mean that if we uh, forget to confess some of our sins, God cannot forgive us? Not at all. That's not the point uh, that, that John is making here. But he is actually emphasizing the importance of self-awareness. He is emphasizing the importance of aligning ourselves to the truth of God's word. He is emphasizing the importance of confessing when we fail, right? Acknowledging, noticing that I'm not perfect. In these areas, I do carry weaknesses and I have made a mistake. And what do we do? We confess or we acknowledge it to the Lord and say, God, I repent. I am sorry. I did this. So you accept it. Okay? 
So if we confess our sins, then what happens? God is faithful to forgive us, right? And he's also just. Does God push our sin under the carpet and behave as if nothing has ever happened? Not at all. It says he is faithful and he is just. How is he just? He has paid the price for every sin by putting it on his son, the Lord Jesus. Okay, the father has done that. And the son has paid the price for our sins. And in that way, he is just to forgive us because the price is already paid. Now somebody has to pay the price for, uh, for uh, uh, the wrongdoing. Someone has to pay the penalty. If the penalty is not paid and you let go the offender, then that is injustice because who is going to pay the fine? But in our case, what has God done for us? He has paid the penalty and therefore he forgives us. He lets us go. And we are told that uh, uh, God is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's able to clean us up because of what Jesus has done for us. So John is uh, affirming that confidence which we have in the uh, work of the finished work of the cross. And verse 10, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And I've already made that point. So this is about walking with God, walking in the truth, walking with humility okay? uh, and experiencing the powerful cleansing work of the cross of Calvary. Okay? And at no point, you know, uh, uh, if you look at it in a practical sense, in a believer's life, generally when we start out, in our journey uh, as believers you know, at the beginning when we are born again uh, we may have a very uh, uh, sort of a like a vulnerable attitude towards god when we are open uh, and we are sensitive and we respond to god easily but as we continue our journey you know there is a possibility for pride to kick in there is a possibility for uh, uh, you know this kind of self deception to kick in uh, it's along the journey and usually uh, at times when we uh, are experiencing great victories in God. You know, many of us uh, here in the class are also part of the ministry and we are serving. And you would agree with me. You know, there are times when ministry goes well, that everyone is praising you. You feel like, wow, you know, this is fine. Like, I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. Okay. And uh, in our prayer lives, we might uh, uh, lean towards... You know, okay, thank you, God. Uh, I'm favored, I'm blessed, and I'm, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But our tendency could be for us to just stay there and never, you know, be sensitive towards God to acknowledge some of our weaknesses as well. So, especially when we are doing well and doing well in the ministry, we have to be careful. Right? And we have to look at ourselves and see, like, Lord, uh, am I living my life according to your truth, your standard, oh God? Because that is the real truth. And that is the real standard. If there's anything I'm missing out, Holy Spirit, convict me. Today, uh, you know, I walk humbly before you. So particularly when we are doing well, we have to be conscious uh, of, of uh, coming to the Lord and uh, checking our hearts and checking our conscience and saying, God, you know, I, I will remain sensitive, even more sensitive at this time when I'm doing well. Because if we are not careful, it is in moments of great victory and, uh, you know, a great accomplishment in our walk with the Lord that we might put our guard down. Okay. And, and that is uh, what brings us down. So be sensitive before the Lord at all times, especially when you are doing well uh, and if there is something that needs to be confessed go ahead and do that because uh, you know we sh we cannot compromise on our fellowship with god and we cannot compromise on our fellowship with our uh, brothers and sisters in christ and for both of this to be effective what we have learned today in 1 john chapter 1 is that we have to walk in the truth we have to walk in righteousness we have to walk in the 
as John uses the term walk in the light and God is light in him there is no darkness that is our standard when we walk in the light then we can experience that beautiful communion with God and beautiful communion with our brothers and sisters so that is John chapter one John chapter one for us I will briefly pause for any of your comments uh, to be added or your your questions to uh, be shared and after that we will move on to chapter two uh, so yes please feel free anything that you want to uh, ask right now you could do so please Okay, glad, glad that uh, it's okay so far. It's clear. That's very nice. Okay, no questions. Okay, it's all clear. Great, wonderful. Let's continue then. Uh, yes, we will move on to uh, one John chapter two, and we we'll look at uh, some of the main themes there. This is a very, uh, I mean, comparatively a longer passage. So I'm not sure how much I can complete today, but uh, let's try to read till. Verse seventeen, please. One John chapter two, verses one through seventeen. Again, uh, we could all read four verses at a time. Anyone, just jump in and read the first four verses. Saying this to you, my children, so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have someone who bleeds with the Father on our behalf. Jesus Christ is righteous one, and Christ Himself is. The means by which our sins are forgiven, and not our sins only, but also the sins of everyone. If we obey God's command, then we are sure that we know Him. If anyone says that he knows Him but does not obey His command, such a person is a liar, and there is no truth in him. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much. Uh, another person could continue. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we have we that we are in him. He that said he abideth in him out himself also, so to walk, even so he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word. Which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Thank you, Dave. Uh, the next person could read, please. He who says. <laughs> He is in the light, and brother, he is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The spiritual state. I write to you, little children, because your sin is forgiven. You for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him. Who is from the beginning? I write to you, young man, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him. Who is from beginning? I have written to you, young man, because you are strong, and the word of abides in you. God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Uh, maybe the next three verses till verse seventeen. One other person could read, please. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in uh, the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who 
as Virginia Scott abides by the Jesus forgiven and set us free. Actually, sin destroys us. Sin destroys the person. That is why Jesus wants us to give a life. That is why he set us free and, and cleansed us. And uh, we are created in the image of God. We are called to represent and show the God to the world. We are called to reflect Jesus on the world. So when he forgives, it's not a, uh, you know, license or a grace to uh, or, or something to continue on sin. Because sin destroys a person and person's life and uh, we cannot show the God and his image on the world that's why we have to leave the sin and wa walk in holiness yes thank you Thomas excellent points there uh, and I'll uh, add to that uh, first, first and foremost there is no sin in God okay and uh, that is the reason and we have been created in the image of God and God does not want anything in us which is not in him. Okay? So and uh, sin is darkness and John has already written about it. So in addition to what uh, Thomas shared, you know, sin uh, is not part of God and sin is not a part of us uh, and God doesn't want that in our lives okay so uh, sin is separate from us and we do have the, the power now now that the lord jesus has died on the cross uh, for us as romans chapter 6 says sin shall not have dominion over us so we can overcome sin and stay away from it okay and uh, rightly as thomas put it it will destroy our lives and god knows that uh, and that's the reason you know he wants us to have nothing to do with sin so uh, 
Yes, so uh, John is uh, encouraging the believers. But look at uh, you know John's point here about Jesus being our advocate. Okay, once again the whole Trinity uh, theme comes in, and uh, John is pointing out that the Father is separate, and then he's pointing out that Jesus is separate. So you know that concept of Trinity is seen in, in the next portion of the verse here. He says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he is describing the Lord Jesus as a, a, a person who can take away our sin. The term advocate here, uh, in the Greek it is parakletos. And parakletos means uh, a comforter. Okay, comforter or somebody who will, will take care of us, take care of the sin for us. So... Jesus has already done that on the cross of Calvary for us. So John is actually encouraging and he's saying, look, the, uh, the gold standard is don't sin. Because that way you will have a blessed life. You don't have to worry about any consequences. You don't have to worry about the fact that sin will destroy you. But you're walking strong with the Lord. However, if you happen to sin, again, there is an encouragement. Don't worry. You have an advocate for you who is the Lord Jesus. Okay. Uh, and uh, he has already done the work of taking away our sin. And verse 2, he says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That's the point that I made earlier that Jesus has paid the price for us. And that is why God is just, God is righteous in. Forgiving us when we accept what Jesus has done on the cross for us. Notice uh, John says that this forgiveness is offered to the believer and it becomes a part uh, of the covenant for us. So we can receive it by faith. But it is also available for the whole world. So those who have not turned to the Lord, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ is also available for them. But what do we need to receive it? We have to believe with our hearts. We must confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Then we are saved. So it is important for us to be saved to receive this available forgiveness. But is forgiveness available for the entire world? Yes, it is available for the entire world. But it is not applicable until we accept the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it uh, seems like uh, uh, Thomas has a question. Uh, Thomas, please go ahead. I see you have raised your hand. Sorry, my phone fell down. That's why I just pressed. Sorry? By mistake, phone is it? Fell, uh, oh, okay, phone okay, okay. From my hand. Okay. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Yeah, then we'll carry on. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we've done uh, two verses. Moving on to the third verse here. It says, now by this we know uh, that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So the point is coming back to our walk or the way we live, the way we overcome sin in our everyday lives, to live a righteous life. See, it, positionally, is it true that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Yes. Okay. And now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the reality. And nobody can take it away from us. Satan cannot accuse us. Positionally, while that is the, the reality, we also have to live it out. Okay? So that living it out is, uh, uh, it must be seen uh, as us keeping the commandments of God. Commandments of God is, is the standards of God. So we keep the standards of God. It's only then that, uh, you know, our claim of knowing him is valid. Otherwise, we are living a self-deceived life that I talked about earlier. You know, we are saying we know God. We are saying God's will and all that. But in practice, we are living a completely different life. So uh, John tells the believer not to live that, uh, you know, hypocritical life. Saying one thing but doing completely, doing something completely different. So he's also uh, 
uh, bringing a tag on such a believer and he's saying that if you don't keep the commandments of God, you are a liar and the truth is not in him. Okay, So uh, obviously, because they are uh, continuing in sin. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So what proves that we love God, that God's love is abiding in us uh, and that you know we truly know this God that we are talking about. It is our obedience. So without obedience, a believer, you know, you can't wholeheartedly claim and uh, you will agree with me. You know, we know deep within, right? We have that sense of something is not okay. I'm not doing this right. Or, uh, you know, what What if someone finds out? Or you're going to church to worship God uh, and you're not able to concentrate. You're not able to focus. You're not able to uh, fully lavish that worship on the Lord because something within you is tricking you. You haven't dealt with the uh, the sin in your life, right? And uh, when when we do that, I mean, I don't know about you, but it has happened to me. There are times when uh, I was a young believer, and there were a couple of things that I really needed to overcome, and uh, I, I had those things in my life, and I continued going to uh, church every Sunday. I remember telling myself, when I go back home today, I will not do this. When I go back home today, I will not waste my time. When I go back home today, you know, I will live righteously. So uh, something within you, when you don't change uh, and, and you don't walk in the truth, right? It will prick us. It will prick us. And uh, John is very strongly saying that when we continue a lifestyle of disobedience, you know, it's as if we are liars and the truth is not in us. And we actually don't know, you know that, that knowing is like knowing God very well, the very nature of God. Okay, but we don't, we actually don't know him. We may know him in theory, but through our lives, we are proving that we don't know God. Verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walks. So he's saying, this is the true test of knowing God. It's a life of righteousness, that you live uh, righteously. Now, it's not referring to, you know, these one-off things that happen. Sometimes we, we stumble, not intentionally, but, you know, it just happens. So he's not referring to that, but he's referring to a continuous uh, giving into a sinful lifestyle. And he's saying that a believer should not have that kind of a life. Now, verse 7, brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment arrived to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So you notice he's talking about a commandment, but basically what he's saying is, you know, the things that we have seen in Christ, the earlier verse, what did he say? Uh, that we must walk just as he walked. So that commandment has already been seen in the life of Jesus, you know, that walk of obedience, that walk of uh, loving the Father, that walk of uh, uh, displaying the agape love of God. It's already been done. How has it been done? You know, you've already seen. That, that's what he writes. Uh, that commandment was already given to you. And again, a new commandment arrived to you. Basically, he is reintroducing that same uh, point uh, that we must live the way Jesus lived. And it has already been demonstrated to us. Verse 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother. Okay? So far, you saw the person who is not living in the light is the person who has sin in their lives. And they are not ready to acknowledge it. So they deceive themselves. That's what we've seen. But now in verse 9 he says, person who does not have light in their lives is also somebody who hates his brother. You notice uh, hate is a rather strong word okay, which uh, he has used here. And let me just uh, uh, share with you what it means in the Greek. Okay. It's from the word, a Greek word, misio, uh, and it means detest. Detest. Detest is, uh, you know, when you can't stand, right? Your, 
you just you're disgusted by something you detest somebody you hate them it's not like you don't like them but it is worse than that you hate them and uh, john is saying look when we say that our life is in the light and if we look into our hearts when we find that we are detesting and he uses the term brother brother was usually used for somebody who is also in the faith okay so it's a believer another believer if you hate your believer then you are still in the darkness okay we can't claim that we know god or uh, no god it's a sign of maturity so that maturity is lacking how do we see that there is proof in our lifestyle we don't acknowledge our sin you know we are disobedient to god and now what's happening there is hatred in our in our hearts not just dislike but detest other believers and all this proves that we are still immature that you know we are not we don't know god very well and verse said he who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him so one of the ways in which we can make our uh, walk secure is to walk in love so whenever we we use uh, uh, you know this this term walk <coughs> it is living out the life and also relating relating to god and relating to people so when we have love for god and we have love for our brothers we are in a secure position or uh, it it says that there is no cause for stumbling in him love is very important you know the love of god shed abroad in our hearts through the holy spirit romans 5:5 5, 5 says that will keep us stable in our christian walk was level but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness so uh, carrying bitterness in our hearts right and we are saying oh i'm such a good believer uh, i'm a faithful believer i'm a mature believer but what does the scripture say well, we can we can claim all these uh, facts about ourselves and maybe you know we we are very regular to church we are a uh, part of many bible studies we know lots of scriptures by heart all that is correct nothing wrong with it but you know, there is a uh, hatred in our hearts for our brothers so when that happens john is pointing out to the fact that something is not right with the maturity okay there is some darkness in us that we do this and we are walking in darkness uh, and we don't know where we are going he says and darkness has blinded our eyes so you see the, there is the spiritual reality but there is also the living it out and both have to be congruent if the spiritual reality is different from the way we are living you know our claiming that we know god our claiming that we are mature that we are spiritual you know it doesn't make sense to god god is noticing disobedience god is noticing you know uh, hatred in our hearts and we can't deceive god right we may even be able to deceive ourselves but you can't deceive god verse 12 onwards he's addressing the people who will uh, listen to uh, who i mean he's addressing the uh, people who will get his letter and he's saying i write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name sake so he uses little children you will see he is using different gradings uh, to probably talk about spiritual maturity and he uses children for those who have experienced the forgiveness of their sins because we know this is the first experience that we all have right uh, that our sins have been forgiven so uh, early on in our christian walk uh, that is our experience he is referring to those young believers as little children then he says i write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning i write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one i write to you little children because you have known the father so he brings in the next level here young men who have overcome the wicked one so obviously uh, those who have grown from uh, just uh, experiencing that forgiveness and uh, walking in their authority they overcome the evil one they are living victorious christian lives john is terming them as young men and he is calling the more mature people who have known 
uh, God from the beginning. Or rather, he is just uh, pointing out that there are mature people who know God very well. They have lived the life, they are living the life, and they also know the spiritual truth. So these kind of people he is calling as fathers. This also shows us that there, there is a journey of maturity that every believer has to make. Just because we are born again, it doesn't mean that everything is perfect in our spiritual walk. No, there are levels, there are uh, you know gradations, uh, if, if you may call it. There are milestones of growth. And we must make the journey and slowly go from being little children to being young men or, or women and also becoming fathers. And verse 14 says, I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So basically he is writing to people at every stage of their spiritual growth. And next, he brings a message about uh, not giving in to worldliness. So far, he talked about obedience. He talked about living in the love of God, being truthful to God, being truthful to ourselves. And now he's going to talk about uh, staying away from the world. I think at this point, I'm going to pause to just give us some time uh, to share your thoughts and questions, if any. If not, we will wrap up. And we will continue from where we left in the next class. So, uh, any any thoughts that you may want to add to what I said so far? All right. Uh, yeah. Okay, Kiran, you want to say something? Yes, ma'am. Little doubt is there. Ma'am, yeah. how John John knows before that believers is uh, doing something different? So he wrote a letter to them. Yeah. So uh, see, Kiran, I told you know that uh, uh, he was providing guidance as an apostle two churches so obviously uh, he he knows the kind of believers that worship in these churches what their lifestyle is okay in the passage you don't find him pointing out sins and saying you know this sin that sin if you recall uh, to the corinthians paul will write and he'll say you know there are there is strife among you there is there are divisions among you there is a sexual sin in your congregation. So he points out different things. But here, John is not pointing out. Uh, but, you know, it's like a message which can be given to all the churches during his time. That is why uh, it sounds very general. But I'm sure each church, as they received the letter, they understood what John is talking about. So he knew that believers were living a kind of a deceptive life and he needed to address that. Okay, fine, sure. All right, so let's uh, close here. Then. Uh, I would request somebody to please say a word of prayer. We have a minute to go uh, and then we are done, for, uh, done with today's class. Uh, who would like to pray? Manu, can you close in prayer, please? Okay, sir. Huh. Father God, I pray to you, Lord Jesus. Father God, I pray to you, Lord Jesus, whatever we and from this class, Father God, Lord Jesus, Lord God, work in our life, Father God. And Lord Jesus, I pray to you, Lord Jesus, bless us, Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we pray to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, Lord Jesus. Uh, you help us, Lord Jesus, to study. And Lord Jesus, thank you, Father, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I submit all prayer in the name of Jesus, I ask. Amen, amen, amen. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Manu. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you're free to log off and join your next class. I'll see you again uh, next Monday to go through the episodes of John. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Thank you.